And take your Bible tonight, if we'll go to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 16. And I want to preach to you tonight on the three Hebrews' finest hour. The three Hebrews' finest hour. My, uh, I, I love this chapter. I've said it before, and I, I do. I love this chapter in the Bible. Uh, we're going to kind of jump right in in the middle of what's going on. If you're not familiar with what's going on, we will just remind you that Nebuchadnezzar the king set up a great golden image and uh, demanded everybody bow down and worship it. When that, So they got everybody out on the plain of Dura where he'd set it up. They played all the music and everybody bowed except three fellows. And those three fellows uh, did not bow and they were brought to the king's attention. And uh, so he said, going to give you another chance, fellows. Going to give you another chance and just let you know that, uh, you know, you've got that chance. And if you don't, you'll be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? And then we come to verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Amen. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. Boy, over and over again in this chapter, you find the name Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego brought up. You'll notice every time you can, the Lord puts their names in this chapter. It's almost like he's reminding you who is doing what they're doing, all right? He just lifts them up. And I tell you, as I read these words, my soul gets stirred, my heart gets thrilled, and, and my spirit just wants to shout a while, all right? Can't help it. Uh, in this day when Christianity is pushed aside, the church is unappreciated, and, and Christians are looked on as second-class citizens. I'll be honest, I enjoy reading account of God's people putting it to the world. Amen. He said, you ought not to have that attitude. Well, you'll have to forgive me for getting in the flesh, I guess, every now and then. But I sure do like it when that kind of thing happens, all right? Amen. I like it when that, that takes place, when God's people stand up, and, and boy, they're just able to say, see there, I told you. I told you, all right? Now, we've looked at the main characters in this chapter. First, we looked and I tried to preach to you on King Nebuchadnezzar, who knew better than what he did. Should never have done what he did. And then we looked at the God who was responsible for all that happened here, that God who shall deliver you out of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's hands. We looked at him last week. Tonight, what I want to do is I want to examine these three men. These three men who stood for their faith in the face of a certain fiery death. Uh, they still stood. There are some things about them that you just, you can't overlook when you get to this chapter. Uh, it's impossible to overlook it. And, and unfortunately, those things we see in their lives seem to be real rare today in the majority of Christians. Real rare things. 
And I just want to jump right in. First of all, I want you to notice there in, in verse uh, 18. I want you to notice that phrase they said to Nebuchadnezzar, who had come and said, you will worship this image that I've set up, or you're going to die. I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. And they said to him, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. He said, we're not going to do it. He said, where's that come from? That comes from conviction. Amen. Conviction. Boy, these men lived by their convictions. When we first meet them in chapter 1, those three along with Daniel stood out because of one thing, because of their convictions. Convictions. They had some convictions. It wasn't a matter of something that they just thought up that day. They didn't just get out that day and look at each other and say, Hey, fellas, what do you say? Let's don't bow and see what happens. No, no, that wasn't what was going on. They had already made up their minds, hey, years before. Amen. There's only one God we serve. We serve the Jehovah God, the God of creation. That's the only God we will serve. And when Nebuchadnezzar put that image up, and he said, you're going to worship it. They knew right then they weren't going to do it. I don't think those three stood together in that crowd that day out on that plane and said, well, fellas, I'm not going to do it. What about you? I believe that all three knew we're not going to do this. Amen. Why? They had some conviction. They had some conviction. Folks, it's the thing that's sadly lacking among God's people today is convictions right. about right and wrong. Now, when I talk about convictions, I'm not talking about some personal opinion that you hold. Right. You know, I, I oftentimes give my Sunday school class a hard time. All right? I, I talk to them about the the evil liberalism that I see rampant in my class sometimes because those men have on colored shirts, all right? And I jump on them about it and say, you fellas ought to be ashamed of yourself, all right? Now, I'm really just giving them a hard time, all right? Now, if you see me and I'm in the pulpit, I'm going to be in a white shirt, all right? You say, it's a wicked sin to preach in a, uh, in, in a colored shirt. Maybe a sin, just not all that wicked, all right? But, uh, you know, I just, hey, I believe a white shirt looks better, so that's what I wear. But I cannot take you into Scripture and say, see, the Bible says, thou shalt preach, thou shalt wear a white shirt. That's not in the Bible. I talked to a lady one time, had her kids in our school, and she, they go to a different church, and she said, we had an evangelist come through one time, and he preached that if a man wore any color socks besides white socks, they'd go to hell. And she said for months after that, the men in our church didn't wear anything but white socks. Well, I said, I just want to ask you, I said, what scripture did he use? She said, none. Now, I'm talking about convictions. I'm talking about Bible convictions. Hey, the problem is in our day, we don't have any. God's people, people that profess to be saved, we don't have any convictions. Hey, look, I, I, I do what I do because of Bible convictions. I, I would attend church. I don't attend church because I'm a preacher. I'm a, I attend church because I'm a Bible-believing Christian and I have a Bible conviction that says I ought to be there. A Bible conviction says I ought to be there. And, and I ought to be there not just Sunday morning. The Bible says so much the more, so I figure the more the better, all right? So to be there all the time. I'm going to be faithful. Why? Because the Bible says I ought to do it. Hey, I tithe. I tithe because I've got a Bible conviction about tithing. Give to God. I've got a Bible conviction about it. Hey, I give to missions. Why? I've got a Bible conviction. got a Bible conviction about it. I can take you to the Word of God and show you, here's what the Bible says. That's why I do what I do. Amen. Hey, I, I, I am what I am because of Bible convictions. Hey, you're, you're a preacher. I dress the way I dress because of Bible convictions. Amen. Bible convictions. And I, it, it's not a matter of me just saying, well, I prefer this. No, I, Bible convictions. You're not going to go by my house and see me mowing my grass in a pair of shorts and no shirt. That's not going to happen. If it does, you get a hold of somebody quick. I have lost my mind, all right? 
And that boy needs mental help. So you, you know that. If you ever see that, don't think, well, that fellow lied in the pulpit. No, he's lost his mind, all right? It's not going to happen, okay? Not going to happen. Hey, if you see my wife, she's going to be dressed every day of the week the way she's dressed on Sunday. Why? Because we got a Bible conviction. Amen. Right. Got a Bible conviction. Hey, I just think it's right to do right. Amen. And somebody says, well, I think. Okay, but what's the Bible say? Yeah, what's the Bible say? We can argue about opinion. But what's the Bible say? I'm going to tell you something. These three Hebrew fellows had Bible convictions, and that's why they stood the way they stood. It's those convictions they live by. Hey, those men refuse to compromise their convictions. Yeah. They wouldn't compromise them. So many people today, we compromise. Sure. We compromise. We give in. Can I say this to you? It's the easiest thing to do. Oh, yeah. Amen. It is so easy to compromise what you believe. I mean, we, we've seen it happen. We've seen it happen across the land. Hey, we've seen it happen in, in churches that were good churches. They compromise what they believe about music. They compromise what they believe about the Word of God. I, I can take you to churches close by where people used to stand and preach and believe the King James Bible is the word of God and tonight if they're having a, if they're having a service tonight he's not preaching out the King James Bible now what happened well he compromised his convictions now there, there's a lot of a lot of pressure to compromise I want to tell you these three men would not compromise their convictions number three I want you to see it they were willing to die for their convictions. Amen. They were willing to die. When they stood in front of King Nebuchadnezzar and said, we will not serve thy God nor worship thy golden image, they realized that meant the death sentence. Hey, we're going to be cast. They realized what's coming, the furnace. We're going in. They knew that. Hey, they were willing to die for their convictions. Willing to die. Hey, first thing I see about a conviction, second thing I see is courage. Courage. Notice what it says there in verse 16. See that in verse 16. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. They did not say, well, we'd like to speak diplomatically. No, they said, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. Why not? Courage. Courage. Hey, it takes some courage to stand there. Convictions are great. Convictions are absolutely necessary. But they absolutely must be backed up with courage. There's got to be some courage. There's got to be within you some courage. Without courage, folks may never know what convictions you have. Because it is your courage that enables you to stand for those convictions when the pressure's on. When the pressure's on. When the pressure gets applied, you stand. If you've got the courage of it. Uh, look, our, our teenagers, it's easy for you to be a teenager at youth camp and have great standards, great convictions. But when you come home, that's when it gets tough. Hey, we've, we've had teenagers go to camp years past, come back, want to do some things, and guess what? You say, other teenagers made fun of them. No, their parents laughed at them. Hey, guess what happened to those teenagers? They didn't turn out too good. They didn't turn out too good. Hey, listen, you need some courage. You're going to have some convictions. Like I say, man, it's easy to do right in the house of God. It's easy to do what's right. Hey, it's easier to do what's right if you're in a big crowd and, and, and everybody's doing the right thing. But when it's you three against everybody else, and oftentimes it's you one, not you three, and everybody's attacking, hey, that's when it takes courage. These three, though, stood. They stood. They knew they were going to. I mean, how are you not going to stand out? That'd be like you being at Mecca and the call to prayer comes out and everybody in Mecca's got a rug oh, yeah. and everybody in Mecca rolls it out and they're bowing and you're not right. 
And you think, I'll blend in? No, you won't, okay? You're not going to blend in. Now, you could say, well, I'll compromise. I'm going to bow, but I'll pray to the real God. No courage. No courage. All right? No courage. Hey, uh, the need for courage to be displayed can really reveal the depths of your convictions. It's when you've got the courage, all right? That really reveals the depths of your convictions how much you really believe it, life and death situations, they're going to reveal what you believe. I mean, when you're standing there, life and death, now I've said it before, it's easy for us to stand here today as Bible believers, as independent, fundamental Baptists, and say, amen to those three Hebrews, but if you were there, I don't know what we'd do. You say, preacher, I'd stand and no, I'd stand. Well, I'd like to tell you, I'd like to think I would stand, but I don't know I would. Amen. You'd have to be there. Amen. You'd have to be there. It's that courage. Courage is what's lacking so many times in so many of God's people. Uh, we've got the right convictions, we've got the right beliefs, but we don't have enough courage to display them. We don't have the courage to stand on what we believe. Those three Hebrews did. Their finest hour was a time of conviction. It was a time of courage. I'll tell you something else. It was a time of confidence. Confidence. Look at it. Look at what they say, all right? Uh, they said here, Our God, in verse 17, whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Hey, did you see that? Our God, whom we serve, is able there's confidence. Amen. And I want you to see their confidence was in God. Amen. It was fully, 100% in God. They believed Psalms chapter 118. Flip over there in your Bible. Psalms chapter 118. They believed these two verses, all right? Psalms 118, there's two verses, verse 8 and verse 9. Back to back, say almost the same thing, real close to the same thing. Uh, but Psalms 118, verse 8 says it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Verse 9 said it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Hey, you know what? They could have, these uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have put their confidence in Nebuchadnezzar. After all, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter, in chapter 2 had said that the God of Daniel is a God of gods. And he's not that. He's the Lord of kings. He's a revealer of secrets. And now he is just a few years later stuck up a golden image and said, worship that. But they didn't put their confidence in him. Their confidence was in God. Amen. If there's one thing you and I need in this day, we need confidence in our God. We ought to have confidence in him. Now, I don't know about you, but I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that God can do what he says he can, and he will do what he says he'll do. And I, you can take it to the bank, any other phrase you want to put on it, God can do it. My confidence in Him. You say, preacher, how do you know you're saved? Because of the one I'm trusting. Amen. The one I'm trusting. I'm not trusting me to hang on to salvation. Right. Amen. I'm not trusting anything I've done to get me to heaven. I'm trusting Him. Right. I'm trusting my confidence is in Jesus Christ. When He went to that cross, I believe He did what the Bible says. When the Bible said He tasted death for every man, I believe that means what it says. Amen. And I believe when he said, whosoever will or whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, I believe that. I called and I believe he saved me. Amen. Believe it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Amen. Where's your confidence? It's in him. Right. Right. It's in him. That's where it's at. Hey, boy, you kind of cocky. No, not me. My confidence in God. Amen. This, the confidence of these fellows wasn't arrogance. It wasn't swagger. It wasn't brag. Okay? It wasn't a matter of those three fellows standing up and saying, well, hey, you know, we just, we're nonconformist. No, it wasn't any of that kind of business. It was some men that stood up and said, listen, uh, our God, whom we serve, is able. 
He's just able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. We, we believe it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Uh, we're not standing here shivering and shaking. Uh, we're not even shimmying because we believe he, He's able to do it. Confidence in Him. Hey, wait a minute. They had already displayed that confidence back there in chapter 1 when they said, just give us pulse and water and we'll be fine. We don't need all the king's meat. We'll be okay. And they were. Why? Confidence in God. Confidence was in God. You know what? Their confidence carried them along too. Carried them along. Got them where they were. Now, they had an absolute outstanding confidence and an outstanding, unbelievable, powerful God. They said, we, we've got some convictions. We believe some things. And, and we've got enough courage to stand on them because we've got confidence in our God. Old Nebuchadnezzar keeps coming back and he had said to him, now listen, if you don't, when you hear that music, if you don't bow, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And who is that God that should deliver you out of my hands? They were basically saying, our God. He's the one that's able. He's the one that can do it. He's the one that's able above all others. He's able to do it. But boy, I want you to notice this next thing about it. Hey, there was, there was you know, conviction. There was courage. There's confidence. But I want you to see this. There was commitment. Because you look at verse 17 real careful, all right? If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. But then look at verse 18. But if not, even. Can I tell you something? I like that if not part. Now you and I know what happened. We know the end of the story. We know the song. They wouldn't bend, they held on to the will of God, so we are told they wouldn't bow. Their knees to the idol made of gold. They wouldn't burn, they were protected by the fourth man in the fire. Yeah, they were. We know the end. But there's not at the end right here, folks. They're saying, our God is able. But if not, we just want to tell you something, all right? Okay. You said, if not, be it known unto thee, we will not serve. We will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image. He said, just you mark it down. Mark it down, we're going to do it. Why? Now that's commitment. Can I say this to you? Their commitment wasn't tied to any particular outcome. A lot of people, we, we make a commitment as long as we know how the outcome's going to come out. Hey, preacher, I'll do that if. I'll do that as long as. No. Their commitment wasn't tied to any outcome whatsoever. They were fully committed to doing right even if God did not spare their lives. That's good. Amen. Fully committed. Now, folks, that's commitment, all right? Here's the problem today. Oh, we don't have the convictions. Then we don't have the courage if we do have them. And then we're a little bit shaky on our confidence because we put a little bit too much confidence in man. But boy, when it comes to this many business commitment, uh-uh, especially if things don't go our way. Well, hey, I used to go to church, but let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. Man, I, I tell you, I, I was faithful, and, but you know, I, our son died. I just couldn't figure out why God let him die. You know what's going on? No commitment. I'm committed to God's own. As long as God does things my way and does things the way I think they ought to be done, then I'm committed to Him. And that would be like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying, Now listen, we're not going to serve your gods. Uh, we're not going to bow down to them. Uh, and uh, our God is able. But I tell you what, if we start getting real close to that thing and it ain't looking good, could we rethink it? Would you give us a third chance? I mean, if if our shoestrings start melting, all right? Hey, no, wait a minute. That wasn't the way it was. Their commitment didn't, wasn't tied to any particular outcome. There's so many people in our world today, they quit when things don't go the way they think it ought to go. We had a wreck. 
and God took my whoever or whatever. You know, I, I just, I, I'm sorry, but that's the wrong way to look at it. That's the wrong way to look at it. Now, you're not looking at a preacher who is heartless. Amen. Who's heartless. Uh, I, I've got great sympathy. And, and boy, I tell you, no, I don't know how it feels. No, I don't. I, I remember a teenager lived over here in the trailer park, came very faithfully to church until her grandpa died. She quit coming. We finally chased her down, and she said, I, I can't come to church anymore. God let my grandpa die. I talked to her. Was your grandpa a Christian? My grandpa was a good Christian. Really, in effect, she's mad because God allowed him to go to heaven. That's right. Amen. But, you know, it, I, we just go on and on and on. I've talked to so many people. I've heard so many stories about so many Christians. Their commitment only lasted until I, something happened that they didn't like and they didn't want, and they quit on God. They quit on God. Hey, listen, we can't do that. You know what our commitment ought to be? It ought to be like old Job said in Job 13.50. Job 13.50, though he slay me. Yet will I trust him. Amen. That is commitment. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I believe that's exactly what they're saying. They said to him in verse 17, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. That's right. yes, sir. He will do that. But if not, we still won't do it. We still won't do it. Conviction. Commitment. Now, can we get to the exciting part? Convincing. Convincing. The king looked in there in verse 25 and he said, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose body the fire had no power. Nor was the hair of their heads singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Amen. Hey, I want to tell you, you know what? Those fellows with conviction, those fellows with courage, those fellows with confidence, those fellows who made a commitment, they convinced a whole bunch of people. They convinced a whole... Why? They convinced them, first of all, I want to say because of their company. They came up and got as close to that old furnace as they could get, looked in, there's four guys. Four men walking around. Now, why is it you figure old Nebuchadnezzar would say what he said? You know, the form of that fourth fellow is like the Son of God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's pretty good company. That's pretty good company, all right? They were there, but he was there. He was there. He was present with them. Right there in that fire. Boy, I'll tell you, that convinced them. That convinced him. Look what old Nebuchadnezzar said. He said, come forth, ye, and, you know, ye servants of the Most High God. He knew what he was talking about. He knew the truth. He said, hey, you fellows, would you all come out? I love what it says. The Bible said he came near. Yeah. You wonder how near he came. <laughs> Remember those soldiers that had thrown Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in died because it's so hot that he killed them. 
And here's Nebuchadnezzar. I'm figuring he's testing it out a little bit. I believe he got close enough that he could yell and hopefully over the inferno be heard, you know. And call their names. Hey, fellas, come on out here. And uh, I, I'm thinking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego maybe thought, no, you come in here. Right? <laughs> you come, all right? We're not coming. You come in here. You're the fellow with all the power. You're the fellow with all the authority. You're the fellow with all the gall. You're the one that said, who is that God? Well, he's in here. You want to meet him? Yeah. <laughs> come on in. Yeah. Oh, listen. That uh, he, they were convincing. They were convincing, my friend, because of their condition. They'd been thrown in bound. Obviously, the, whatever they'd used to bind them had burned off. And now they're walking around. They come out. Nothing. They were alive, first of all. Okay. When they came out, they, they were convinced, okay, those weren't just some trick of the flames. These guys come walking out of that flame. They were alive. That would be rather convincing, don't you think? That, but then to come up to them and notice, what in the hair on their hair is head singed? Nothing. Nothing harmed. They got up close enough to them where they not only could look at them and see they were alive, no hair singed, but man, you guys don't even smell like smoke. That's better than a lot of places. Man, I go visit and come, come home and my wife said, where have you been? <laughs> so man, you come out and you, you, you go in that house and you sit there a while and you come out and your clothes just reek with it. Yes, Not these. Man, it, it was clean. They, there wasn't a smell of the fire on them. I want to tell you something. They were convincing because of their contribution. Would you look at the words that were used there. Notice in verse 28. Notice what Nebuchadnezzar said. He said that he sent his angel, delivered his servants, and trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, notice, and yielded their bodies. Yielded their bodies. Hey, does that sound to you? Familiar to you New Testament Christians? Does that sound familiar to you and I that live in the, the New Testament day? In this day of grace? Where the Bible says present your bodies. Hey, these fellows did that. These fellows did it. They yielded their bodies. Can I say this? That's what we're supposed to do. That is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to yield our bodies. Man, what a testimony this chapter is to the faithfulness of a God. And that God, He'll stand with you. He'll stand for you. He'll stand on behalf of those that will stand for Him. Can I say this to you? I don't believe our God's changed. I don't believe our God's changed. Not, not a bit. You said, preacher, you mean you, you still think he'd take you through that fiery furnace and you'd come out alive? One way or the other. One way or the other. Now you say, well, you're, you're kind of quick enough. No. My, I'll remind you of what the three Hebrew fellows said, all right? They, they said to him, all right, uh, they, they said to him, we're not going to serve you. We, our God's able, and he will deliver us out of thine hand. Right. See, he was going, God was going to deliver them out of their hand one way or the other. Now, he might have delivered them out of their hand by death. Oh, yeah. Amen. Their physical bodies may have died. They may have been burned up. But, hey, they would have been to heaven. Amen. They would have went to be with the Lord. They, they had to come out all right. Yeah, I still believe God's in that business. The question is, how far are we willing to follow their example? Right. Folks, I want to tell you, there's people around the world today that are being thrown into the fire, yes, literally. Amen. Just just what in the last week or two, we had the stories of these folks, these ISIS folks, Amen. taking that Jordanian pilot 
and putting him in a cage and burning him alive. Burning him alive. So, well, that, that's over there, man. That's not over here. Uh, don't get too comfortable. Don't get too comfortable. We, we need to be real careful about it, all right? There's a lot of people today facing death for their faith. Those, that, those ISIS fellows went in, and, and when they began to try to set up that Islamic state, the first thing they did is look for Christians. Amen. And they killed every one of them. You know, I just wonder, are we willing to follow these men's example? Are we willing to have some conviction? Bible convictions, and then the courage to stand on those, all right? And just ask you this, can we have the courage to have some conviction and confidently commit ourselves to God as we try to convince the lost and dying world? Do we have that? Do we have that? Folks, God still needs people like that. Amen. God still needs people like that. Not arrogant, not boastful, not cocky, but those that believe God, trust Him, have some convictions and willing to say, those convictions are not for sale. Amen. You can threaten me any way you want to, but whatever you want to do, it's not going to matter. It's not going to change. Hey, we can't even stand, so many of God's people, they can't even stand a little bit of somebody making fun of them because they believe Amen. something. Man, alive. You say, well, what are you going to do if people laugh? Let them laugh. Amen. Doesn't bother me. I let them laugh. Go ahead. Well, they're making fun of me. Let them do it. I'll tell you, folks, there's a better day coming. Amen. Yes, sir. I, I can't help it. We'll go back to chapter 3 there, all right? I want you to go to verse 8. Amen. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Right. I got news for you. I think those Chaldeans were going just like this. When they were taking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bound and throwing them in the fire. I believe there was jealousy. There was envy. I believe they were saying, we got rid of them guys. We'll have their position now. They're done for. Amen. And then the word came, comes down. Hey, something's going on in that fire, fellas. There's something happening over there. We need to rethink this. We better take a look. We better take a look. Sure enough, they look in and uh, maybe they were the ones that the king said, did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? Oh yeah, that's what we did. Well, would you look? I see four. Count them. How many do you see? Yeah. I just can't help but believe they were in that number over there of the princes, the governors, the captains, the king's counselors. That's who those Chaldeans were. Yeah. And they were the ones that come by. Why? Because they couldn't believe their eyes, first of all. They couldn't believe their eyes. Are we sure this is the same guys? Was there some hidden mirrors that were used here, you know? I mean, is what do you guys name Houdini? And they didn't know. They were trying to figure it out. But it went up, man. They were alive. Man, their coats hadn't been changed, all right? And, and their hair, hair wasn't singed. I mean, you know, that means, have you ever, uh, a lot of garments, something you can take a, match and you use it to repair a tear or a rip you know something's going you can just do that and kind of cauterize it I guess you'd say and keep it from going further they, maybe they look there wasn't any sign of that kind of thing on their clothes they didn't smell of any smoke hey God did something that only God could do Amen. but I still believe God's in that business today and I believe he wants some people to stand for him today you may not face death. You may not face death. I'm not standing here telling you that you will face death and you'll have to take that stand, but you could. And I hope you and I, if we had to, would have the courage to say, go ahead, pull the trigger, lower the lever, whatever. But, hey, we've got some convictions. We can't violate those convictions. Uh, <coughs> Old Brother Roloff was there in Corpus and he said, just can't take your 
just just can't take your paper, you know. Cannot take that license. Because I've got I'm licensed by a higher authority, so I can't Amen. take yours. That's right. Amen. Can't take yours. <clears throat> you know what? Yeah, a lot of people made fun of him, but I'm gonna tell you something there. Like, there's a lot of people respected Brother Rolloff too. Amen. Sure. You bet, man. You bet. So well it wasn't long he died in a plane crash. Yep, God took him home. God knew what he was doing. I knew what listen. What we need is a, a generation of, of Bible-believing people that really believe the Bible. Right. And that will stand up and say, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. And, and it doesn't matter what it is in our day. It, hey, we're not going to perform same-sex weddings. Hey, we're not going to do that. Right. That's, right. That's wrong. We're not going to do it. Right. Can't do it. Hey, uh, well, you got to bake them a cake. Nope, won't do that either. Right. Won't do it. Just, just can't do it. Won't do it. We'll shut down your business. Shut her down. Amen. Can't do it. Amen. Can't do it. Won't do it. We, we need some people who's got some courage. Right. That's what we need. Some conviction. And that will make that commitment to God in full confidence that he's able to do what he said he'd do. Are you there? Heavenly Father, we ask now, you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, you've given us a tremendous example in the Word of God of three men that loved you, believed you, and stood because of what they believed. Dear God, we can do nothing less. It, it's time for us to have that kind of courage. It's time for us to have that kind of conviction. It's time for us to... To, to just step out and, and Lord, put our confidence and, and then make that commitment to you. Lord, no matter what happens, no matter what comes, I'll serve you. I'll serve you. Lord, if it means dying, I'll die for you. Lord, help us to have that kind of faith. Help us to have that kind of courage and make that kind of commitment because that's what's needed in this day to convince the lost that our God's real. Lord, he's able. Help us to do it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand tonight as we come to the invitation time? God's dealt with your heart. Maybe look, maybe you just need to make that commitment. You don't have to come make it to me. You just need to make it to God. I, I think we ought to come a time. We ought to commit ourselves before him totally, completely. Lord, I'm going to do your will. I'm going to take a stand. Whatever happens, you, I, I'm going to be there. God, help us to do it. As we sing tonight, if God's dealing with you, you come.